किशोर भाई यू कैन स्टार्ट यू टॉक जस्ट आफ्टर टेन सेकेंड के दे बोला है। अमुल भाई शुरू कर यस। एंड गुड इवनिंग रिस्पेक्टेड फिजिशियंस आफ्टर लॉन्ग ब्रेक ऑफ रमादान एंड ईद उल फितर वी आर बैक अगेन This is 69th session of our lecture series, ACG study organized by ACG study group. Today is our topic is uh, chamber enlargement, and our speaker today is Ashok Prasad Dr. Shamil Kumar Pundu from National Institute of Cardiovascular Diseases. Before start of the lecture session, I'd like to request Professor Abdul Wahid Chowdhury sir to introduce Shamil Kumar Pundu sir, and then we proceed for the lecture. Wahid sir. Uh, sorry good evening everybody and assalamu alaikum today we are going to have one of the lecture the part of our basic series uh, we call it is it the basic and beyond and the basic part is that whoever is first introduced into interpretation of ecg they will have some good understanding of how to interpret the basic things in the ecg and today the Speaker is none other than Professor Shomit Kumar Kundu. I have been lucky enough to be one of his teachers uh, when I was in NSBT. At present, he is working in our National Institute. Professor Shomit and his wife, who is also a cardiologist, come medicine specialist. Both of them are keen students, keen observers, and. They also are engrossed in teaching, and that something is very important for the continuation of medical education. Uh, before uh, progressing any more, I would really, I'm really grateful for all the audience who have joined us. There's, there's been a uh, big hiatus for each and everything. From today, we'll have our regular lectures. Every second and fourth Sunday, uh, around nine thirty, if possible, that will be better. And the new lecture series started with Professor Shomit Kumar Kundu. Shomit, you can start. Good thing first session is half century. Sixty-one <laughs> participant now. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Dear sir, thank you very much for your kind words regarding me. Uh, today i am very much delighted and honored for giving me the opportunity i express my thanks and gratitude uh, to the organizers of the ecg study group especially uh, the founder uh, course director professor dr abdul wahid choudhury sir professor dr m athari sir uh, professor dr rufiq ahmed sir uh, professor choudhury uh, ais hasan sir aziz sir jamil sir and uh, asif jaman tushar respected teachers fellow colleagues and learned audiences welcome to you all today's uh, ecg lecture lecture number 61 topics uh, cardiac chamber enlargement detection of cardiac chamber enlargement introduction cardiac chamber hypertrophy and or enlargement has important prognostic implications ecg is the technique most often recommended in the diagnosis of chamber enlargement the two term enlargement and hypertrophy the enlargement term is used for uh, atrium the hypertrophy is the term mainly used for ventricles there are four chambers in the heart uh, two atria and two ventricles so each chamber can be enlarged by disease conditions the right atrial enlargement left atrial enlargement right ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular hypertrophy atria become dilated rather than hypertrophied dilatation of heart chambers in which heart muscles are stressed 
and chamber become enlarged. Morphologies of ventricular enlargement are secondary to a hypertrophy rather than to dilatation. Hypertrophy in which the heart muscle fibers actually increase in size with resultant enlargement of chamber. The two terms, hypertrophy and enlargement, are often used interchangeably. So enlargement versus hypertrophy. Enlargement is simply the increased chamber size. And hypertrophy is simply increased chamber wall thickness. This is the um, structure of the heart, uh, the uh, reference from uh, Robin's uh, pathology book. Uh, the upper left uh, shows the concentric hypertrophy of the LV without dilatation. The next concentric hypertrophy of the LV without dilatation. Now this is the hypertrophy of the LV with dilatation. This is the normal structure of cardiac uh, muscles and this is the hypertrophied muscles. So ischemic presentation of the causes and consequences of cardiac hypertrophy. The cardiac hypertrophy occurs when increased mechanical work of either ventricles. It may be pressure overload, it may be volume overload, or it may be uh, trophic signals due to activation of uh, beta adrenergic receptors. In case of uh, pressure uh, uh, overload, the hypertrophy occurs uh, the new sarcomere develops, the new sarcomeres assembles in parallel to the long axis of the uh, muscle cells as a result of the cross-sectional area of the muscle increase and hypertrophy of heart. But in case of volume overload, here the increased sarcomeres are arranged in within the existing sarcomeres. As a result of sequences, it uh, stresses and dilatation occurs. So the hypertension causes pressure overload valvular heart disease causes pressure and or volume overload and myocardial infarction causes regional dysfunction with volume overload. As a consequence, increased cardiac work, increased cell stress, cell stretch, hypertrophy and or dilatation. So, characterized by increased heart size and mass, protein synthesis, abnormal proteins, fibrosis and inadequate vasculature. And they are after the consequences of the hypertrophy. So atrial activation occurs after impulse formation from the sinus node. Normally activation of the right atrium occurs first, followed by left atrial activation. Abnormalities of the POA that are related to anatomic and physiological abnormalities in the right and left atrium. The term P mitrally, P congenitally, and P pulmonary were later replaced by left atrial enlargement and right atrial enlargement. Some uh, students uh, uh, frequently asked question in the examination, the causes of the right atrial ligament. There are some causes here, the congenital heart disease, especially um, my, uh, pulmonary stenosis, pathology of fellows, corporal pulmonary, pulmonary stenosis and regurgitation, pulmonary hypertension due to any cause, tricuspid stenosis and regurgitation, right ventricular hypertrophy due to any cause, and Everstein anomaly. Some causes of left atrial enlargement, mitral stenosis and regurgitation, left ventricular hypertrophy, aortic valve disease, cardiomyopathies. Causes of left ventricular hypertrophy, it may be due to pressure overload or due to volume overload. In case of pressure overload, systemic hypertension, co-optation of the aorta, aortic stenosis and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Due to volume overload, aortic regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, patent ductus arteriosus, dilated cardiomyopathy and VSD. Causes of right ventricular hypertrophy are more similar uh, to the uh, right atrial hypertrophy, the congenital heart disease, corpulmonary, pulmonary stenosis, regurgitation, tricuspid stenosis, regurgitation, mitral stenosis, hypertension, and ARVD. Causes of the biventricular hypertrophy, VSD, PDA, and Eisenmenger syndrome. Now, what should you look for an surface? In case of uh, atrial enlargement, look carefully the uh, POA. And in case of ventricular hypertrophy, uh, look carefully the QRS complexes, the amplitude of the R wave or amplitude of the S wave, QRS duration or ventricular activation time. This is the features of left atrial enlargement. Features of left atrial enlargement, the P wave is normally uh, uh, best observed in the limb disc, especially in the lead two and V1. In lead two, it is upright, and lead uh, V1, it is uh, biphasic. The normal period duration uh, more the, uh, less than 120 millisecond. 
So in case of left atrial adjustment, P wave duration more than equal to 120 millisecond. In case of NOST P wave uh, with interpret duration more than 40 millisecond. In case of V1, lead V1, the terminal negativity in lead V1, that means P terminal force, duration more than 40 millisecond or depth more than one millimeter. Features of right atrial adjustment, peaked, tall peaked P wave amplitude more than 2.5 millimeter in case of uh, limb lead, especially uh, lead two, and P wave amplitude in the V1 more than 1.5. In case uh, features of biatrial enlargement, as a combination of two atrial enlargement in same issue, here P wave in the lead two, uh, amplitude increase more than 2.5 millimeter and duration more than 120 millisecond. In case of V1, the positive uh, portion, that means the right atrial part is more than 1.5 millimeter and the negative terminal force uh, more than one millimeter depth and more than 40 millisecond duration. This is a normal P wave. P wave is composed of right atrial portion and left atrial portion. Right atrial portion is the first upper, then left atrial portion. And the dome is produced by the two atrium. Here, the right atrial hypertrophy, only the right atrial portion uh, amplitude increased more than 2.5 millimeter. And in case of left atrial enlargement, the duration more than 120 millisecond, as the left atrial portion is increased. So this is the normal P wave. This is the P pulmonary. This is the P mitrally or left atrial enlargement. So in very uh, easy uh, to memorize the right for height and left for length. So uh, if we observe in case of lead two and lead V1, in case of lead one, the P wave amplitude is more than 2.5 millimeter, then it is the light at, right atrial adjustment. In case of V1, the positive portion is the right atrial part and the uh, amplitude is more than or equal to 1.5 millimeter uh, indicates right atrial adjustment. In case of left atrial adjustment in uh, uh, lead two, the duration more than 120 millisecond. And in case of NOST P wave, the interpeak duration more than 40 millisecond. In case of V1, the negative terminal force or negative part is more than one millimeter depth and more than 40 millisecond uh, duration. So this is the camel hub is a NOST and then two peaks. The P wave abnormality is associated with left atrial digestion, left atrial hypertrophy, conduction delay, or elevated uh, pressure. This is the 50 years old male uh, smoker. The ECG shows the uh, P wave, tall peak P wave in the lead two, three, and AVF, and also V1. There is also a tall R wave in the V1 and also uh, right axis deviation. This is the typical features of the um, right atrial enlargement uh, in case of uh, this is the patient of uh, COPD with corporal monarchy. The tall peak P wave, right ventricular hypertrophy, and right axis deviation. This is the uh, tall peak P wave with the lead two and the uh, uh, lead V1. This is the right atrial adjustment. This is the ECG uh, showing the P wave wide uh, nose, uh, the, that means P mitrally, uh, duration more than 120 millisecond and interpeak duration, uh, duration more than 40 millisecond. In case of lead V1, this is totally negative P wave. That means left atrial enlargement. Jepo. This is the 40 to uh, 24 years old female with a palpitation and shortness of breath at this ECG. In this ECG, there is a right axis deviation, P wave uh, increase in amplitude and duration. In case of V1, P wave is biphasic and uh, positive portion more than 1.5 millimeter duration and uh, negative P terminal force more than one millimeter depth and uh, more than 40 millisecond duration. There is also a uh, uh, tall R wave in the V1. So this is the ECG of uh, biatal enlargement and right ventricular hypertrophy. In the case of uh, corticodermatic heart disease with mitral stenosis with severe pulmonary hypertension. So this is the biatal enlargement. ECG features of ventricular enlargement. This is the normal uh, uh, ventricles, right ventricles and left ventricles. In case of ventricular uh, hypertrophy, we search for left ventricular hypertrophy, we search uh, 
long, tall ROF in the left precordial leads, especially V5 and V6, and look for deep S wave in the uh, right precordial leads in the V1 and V2. In case of right ventricular hypertrophy, thus this is the mirror image, just opposite. We search for tall R wave in the right precordial leads and deep S wave in the left precordial leads. Left ventricular hypertrophy. The ECG criteria for the diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy consists of increased QRS amplitude, secondary STT abnormalities, left arterial enlargement, left axis deviation, QRS duration more than 90 second, millisecond, and delayed intrinsic deflection. The increased voltage uh, due to increased LV mass, increased LV surface, increased intracavitary blood volume, and closer proximity of the LV to the chest wall. This is the causes of the how voltage increase in the left ventricular hypertrophy. Factor influencing QRS voltage. Number one is sex, race, body habitus, and uh, technical. Is more than 35 years, the ECG uh, QRS voltage uh, gradually uh, decreased, but less than 35 years, voltage may be high in case of less than 35 years. In case of female, Female genders at QRS voltage is slightly lower than the male. Race, uh, racial variance, uh, the African Americans are the high voltage than the others uh, ethnicity. Body habitus, the obese person uh, causes decreased uh, QRS voltage and lean thin person, uh, female with mastectomy, the increased voltage. There may be technical error uh, for uh, factor influences the QRS voltage. There are several criteria to determine the left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, the, uh, but uh, some of them are the first of all, uh, Socoliolian uh, criteria. Here, S wave in the V1 and R wave in V5 or V6, more than 35 millimeter, more than equal to. The corneal criteria, the R wave in the AVL and S wave in the uh, V3 is more than 28 millimeter for male. And in case of female, it is more than 20 millimeter. Modified corneal criteria, the ROA length is uh, greater than twin, uh, 12 millimeter. The Talbot criteria, the ROA in AVL more than 60 millimeter. The Coitu and Spotty criteria, the normally uh, ROA is more than V5 than V6. But in case of reverse, so when ROA in V6 is more than the V5, uh, it is uh, highly specific for uh, left ventricular hypertrophy the Framingham score and Romhild stress point score system. The Romhild stress point score uh, system for LBs, there are 13 points. The five more than or equal to five points is suggestive for left ventricular hypertrophy. The three points for uh, voltage criteria, three points for ST depression, TO wave inversion in patient without digoxin. In patient with digoxin, it uh, only one point. The left arterial enlargement, three points left axis deviation two points, and the QRS duration more than 90 milliseconds, and intrinsic deflection is more than 50 seconds. So total 13 points. The in case of voltage criteria, the largest R wave or S wave any limb leads carries three points. S wave in V1, uh, V2 more than 30 millimeter. V, uh, R wave in V5 or V6 more than uh, 30 millimeter. Each carry three points and total number three points. The Framingham score is that there is must present of STT changes, secondary changes or repolarization changes, plus any one of them, the ROA in lead one and SOA in lead three more than equal to 25 millimeter, SOA in V1, V2 plus ROA in V5, V6, that means Socolalion criteria more than 35 millimeter, SOA in V1 or V2 more than 25 millimeter, ROA in V5 or V6 more than 25 millimeter. So uh, this is the Socololion criteria, the highest uh, any of the point of the uh, V5 and V6 plus uh, SOA uh, in the V1, more than uh, equal to 35 millimeter indicates left ventricular hypertrophy. The corneal criteria, the ROA height in the AVL and SOA in the lead three, more than 28 millimeter in case of male and female more than 20 millimeter. There is several criteria. The sensitivity is very low, but specificity is very high. In case of uh, 
R wave in lead one and S wave in lead two or three more than 25 millimeter is the criteria. R wave in the, in the AVL more than 11 millimeter. The so called Leon criteria uh, carries sensitivity 22% and specificity about 100%. The R wave in the only R wave in the V5 or V6 more than 26 millimeter uh, is a 98% specificity. The Cornell criteria 96% specific. Uh, the Romhill test score in case of five points, the 95 about 95 percent specificity, but specific, uh, sensitivity uh, 35 percent. So left ventricular hypertrophy occurred in two types: left ventricular volume overload and left ventricular pressure overload. The left ventricular volume overload indicates very tall R wave, ST segment, and uh, near the baseline, or maybe. Uh, slightly upward concavity elevation and symmetrical T wave upright. And there may be narrow Q wave. This is the findings of left ventricular volume overload. In case of uh, left ventricular systolic overload, there is a J point uh, depression, ST segment depression uh, downwards and convexity upwards, and there is asymmetrical T wave. There is asymmetrical T wave, or uh, in case of volume overload, there is symmetrical upright T wave. This is the hypertensive male patient uh, here the um, Sokololion criteria, tall are in V5 and V6 and SOAB in the V1 more than 35 millimeter. In case of ABL, uh, ROA more than 11 millimeter. In case of ROA in the um, lead one and SOAB in the lead three more than 25 millimeter. The Cornell criteria, the uh, ROA in ABL more than 11 millimeter and so in the lead three, more than uh, 28 millimeter. So this is the um, ICG uh, with uh, secondary STT changes uh, uh, with uh, asymmetrical T wave inversion. So this is the um, uh, hypertensive uh, patient. Uh, this is the pressure overload features due to hypertension. This is the another ICG patient presented with synco. Uh, there's a left ventricular hypertrophy with strain pattern. This is the ECG of uh, aortic stenosis patient. So all criteria, uh, Socrolyon criteria fulfilled, uh, AVL uh, uh, more than 11 millimeter. And there is also uh, left atrial uh, enlargement and also left axis deviation. So this is the uh, ECG of left ventricular hypertrophy with strain pattern. This is the um, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, tall ROA, ST segment uh, near baseline and uh, symmetrical upright T wave and narrow Q wave. This is the um, left ventricular hypertrophy with volume overload. This is the another example of left ventricular hypertrophy with volume overload. Uh, the, here is the left atrial enlargement also. This is a patient uh, with uh, deputed uh, palpitation and family history of uh, sudden cardiac death. Here is the um, tall R wave in the lateral pictorial leads, ST depression, and asymmetrical T wave. Uh, this is the ECG from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is the um, patient with uh, tall uh, voltage criteria full field, but uh, there is a short PR interval and delta wave. This is the um, ECG of WPW syndrome. But patient's echo shows the concentric hypertrophy of the LD. He also um, having a concentric uh, variety of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is the another uh, pitfall of the diagnosis of the left ventricular hypertrophy uh, in presence of WPW syndrome. So this is the yep. um, ECG of atrial fibrillation. Uh, this is the um, left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, and there is a thumb impression, thumb uh, segment and a, a reverse tick sign of the ST segment. So this is the ECG of a patient with uh, mitral stenosis with severe mitral regurgitation with uh, atrial fibrillation. So this is the another cause of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy may be present with uh, atrial fibrillation. ECG diagnosis uh, of LVAs in presence of left band band dance block. In patient with LVB, with, uh, there is a difficulties to diagnose uh, left ventricular hypertrophy uh, specifically low and maybe inaccurate. But there is some features suggestive of um, left ventricular hypertrophy in presence of LVB. In that case, uh, 
may be present left atrial enlargement, but the QRS duration is very important. If the QRS duration more than 150 millisecond or more than 160 millisecond, plus uh, uh, any one of the voltage criteria suggestive of uh, left ventricular hypertrophy in presence of LBB, such as uh, this is the another study uh, in the SOAB in V2 and ROAB in V6 is greater than more than 45 millimeter is diagnostic. But uh, another sucrolyon index more than 35, ROAB in AVL more than 11 millimeter, and uh, combination of the um, SOAB in V2 and V3 uh, more than 55 millimeter, 30 millimeter and 20 millimeter. So this is the ECG of um, left bundle branch block. There is a Mm, very deep uh, SOF and uh, combination of the um, SOF in V2 and uh, ROF in the V6, uh, more than uh, 45 millimeter. And QRS duration uh, uh, is prolonged. This is the uh, ECG of LBB with uh, hypertension, uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. ECG diagnosis of LVAs in the presence of RBB. In right bundle branch block, LBS is suggested by uh, left atrial adjustment pattern, secondary STT changes, and there is a S wave in lead three and maximum RS uh, R plus S in any precordial leads more than 35 millimeter is suggested of left ventricular hypertrophy in presence of right bundle branch block. This is the um, incomplete right bundle branch block. Uh, this is the um, uh, here no SOAB in the lead three, but uh, some of the um, precordial leads uh, are S more than 35. Goldberg's uh, electrocardiography tried for uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. That is the um, SOAB in uh, V1 or V2 plus ROAB in V5 or V6 more than 35 millimeter. Total QRS amplitude in each limb needs less than eight millimeter and RS ratio less than one in case of lead four, V4. This is the um, Goldberg criteria. The um, in precordial leads, uh, total height of the QRS less than eight millimeter and RS ratio in uh, lead four less than one. And the um, combination of the two is more than uh, 45 sopololion criteria. So this is the um, ECG features of the dilated cardiomyopathy. Another uh, frequently asked question in examination, difference between the left ventricular hypertrophy and ischemia. In case of ischemia, there is usually horizontal ST depression and symmetrical T wave inversion. And ECG, ST segment elevation occur during STMI. And the STT changes are uh, dynamic. But in case of left ventricular hypertrophy, the ST segment uh, downwards, convexity upwards, there is asymmetrical T wave, and there may be ST segment elevation in lead V1 to V3. And the STT segment are usually static. And there's a difference between the ischemia and left ventricular hypertrophy. It falls in diagnosis of the left ventricular hypertrophy. The condition which uh, increases the left ventricular uh, voltage, which interferes with the diagnosis. That is, uh, is less than 35 years uh, in association with WP Dudley syndrome or left axis deviation or racial variation. Some condition which causes um, QRS voltage may be decreased, such as uh, mixed edema, pericardial diffusion, corpal monally, uh, large anterior MI, even heart muscle disease like the dilated cardiomyopathy, amyloidosis, scleroderma. This is the pitfalls of the diagnosis uh, of left ventricular hypertrophy in these conditions. Right ventricular hypertrophy. The diagnostic criteria, uh, right axis deviation is the clue. The dominant ROA in the lead uh, V1, more than seven millimeter, or RS ratio, more than one. Dominant S wave in V5 or V6 more than 7 millimeter or RS ratio less than 1. Even duration of the QRS less than 120 millisecond. Supporting criteria right atrial enlargement, uh, secondary right ventricular strain pattern, and deep S wave in the lateral leads. There may be associated with right bundle branch block. 
there's a right ventricular hypertrophy first clue, the axis deviation. There is a right axis deviation, the R wave height and S wave uh, amplitude and QRS duration must be uh, less than 120 milliseconds. This is the uh, diagnostic criteria of uh, right ventricular hypertrophy. Right ventricular hypertrophy, again, two types, right ventricular hypertrophy with uh, pressure overload and right ventricular hypertrophy with volume overload. In case of right ventricular hypertrophy with pressure overload, the tall ROA, ST depression, and asymmetrical T wave inversion. But in case of right ventricular uh, volume overload, there may be RVB pattern and uh, T wave uh, change does not occur. Diagnosis of right ventricular hypertrophy in presence of right bundle branch block is the another uh, difficult situation, but uh, Barker and Valencia criteria is in case of incomplete RBB, if there is R wave height more than 10 millimeter, and in case of complete RBB, if there is R wave height more than 15 millimeter, then suggestive of uh, right ventricular hypertrophy in the presence of uh, RBB, but sensitivity and specificity is lower. Now, various uh, diagnostic criteria, their sensitivity and specificity. Uh, RS ratio in V1 more than one, uh, the 98% specificity. Uh, uh, ROA in V1 more than seven millimeter is 99% specificity. The opposite, same reverse uh, is the SOA in the V5, V6 more than seven millimeter and V5, V6 RS ratio less than one. This is the 93% specificity. This is an 18 years girl presented with central sinusis and digital clubbing. Air uh, right axis deviation present. Uh, there is a tall R wave in V1, uh, J point depression, ST depression, and asymmetrical. That means right ventricular hypertrophy with strain pattern. This is the um, patient uh, from uh, repeated uh, palpitation and syncope. There is a uh, right axis deviation, the first clue. Then uh, the RS ratio in the lead one, more than one. And there is a um, epsilon wave uh, in the junction. This is the ECG of um, adipogenic uh, right ventricular <coughs> dysfunction. Pitfalls in diagnosis of right ventricular hypertrophy. The there is some uh, problem in the diagnosis of BCG in the presence of the followings, such as right bundle branch block, WPW syndrome, true posterior MI. In case of children, maybe normal uh, voltage may be uh, higher, early transition, dextroposition or dextrocardia. In case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, that may, there may be tall ROA and uh, V1 and RS ratio more than one may be observed. In case of biventricular hypertrophy, there is any presence of left ventricular hypertrophy plus any sign of the right ventricular hypertrophy include right axis deviation, right atrial enlargement. Uh, there is a biphasic QRS complex in the mid precordial lead, especially V2 to V5. The total combination of the R wave and S wave more than 50. This is a uh, cares washel phenomena and deep S wave in the V5 or V6. In case of uh, presence of the RVS, additional signs indicating, indicating the left ventricular hypertrophy include the tall R waves and deep S waves in V2 to V5 and QRS amplitude more than 50 millimeter. This is the ECG features of I the- I think we are missing the sound. This is the ECG showing a tall R wave in the mid, uh, tall R wave in V1, uh, more than uh, seven millimeter, RS ratio more than one. There is a increased QRS voltage in the mid uh, portion, more than 50 uh, millimeter total uh, length of the R wave and has, uh, S wave. This is a catch washel phenomenon. It is uh, found mostly in the uh, ventricular septal defect and other uh, congenital heart diseases. So, summary of the ventricular hypertrophy um, in right ventricular hypertrophy and left ventricular hypertrophy. The, if you found the tall R wave in case of right ventricular hypertrophy in the, and secondary STT changes in the lead V1 and V2. And in case of left ventricular hypertrophy, it is the left-sided lead, such as one AVL and V5, V6. That's opposite uh, for the S wave. The usually deep S wave in the right ventricular hypertrophy found in the one AVL, V5, V6, 
and in case of left ventricular hypertrophy it found v1 and v2 in case of right ventricular hypertrophy this is right axis deviation in case left ventricular hypertrophy left axis deviation in case of right ventricular hypertrophy right atrial enlargement in case of left ventricular hypertrophy left atrial enlargement there may be uh, right ventricular hypertrophy with rbb and left ventricular hypertrophy with lbb present there is additional criteria for uh, right ventricular hypertrophy there is poor progression of rof and there is delayed intrinsic square duplication conclusion ecg is very specific but not sensitive for diagnosis of chamber enlargement but ecg is the cheapest and most readily available clinical utility is limited by its low sensitivity thanks to all for options here All right, uh, I can make some comments. Actually, very nice overview of ECG criteria for chamber enlargements. Uh, one thing I'd like to just for our students and trainees to make sure they understand uh, the clinical connection of this chamber enlargement. They, they, they need to keep in mind uh, that the chamber enlargement happening for a few reasons, right? One is pressure overload or after stress, uh, you know, while stress is high or after load is high in certain area and valvular problem, but they also are connected, okay? So in that situation, this, this component they have to keep in mind and second component they have to keep in mind, what is the axis on the EKG, ECG, okay? So if you look at that, I have a heart model here Okay, and as you know, always think about three dimensional way rather than memorizing it. Because you mentioned, Dr. Kundu mentioned that students are asking what are the reason for like left atrial enlargement or left ventricular enlargement, you know. So, but if you, if you keep in mind three dimensional way, say what, what are the problem there? What direction the axis is going? If you have left ventricular enlargement, definitely, then you will have uh, the axis is going to go to the left side, right? That's, that's left side is presented by one AVL, even minus 30 degree to the left shoulder area and V5, V6. Look at those leads. And if, if you can look at that, those leads, focus on those leads, and then you'll see all the criteria depends on that. Like coronal criteria, they have AVL. Uh, uh, you know, a modified coronal also AVL. So, because those are in the left side. So if you see, left axis deviation, you start thinking about, you know, with, the, with this, and if you see other criteria there, and then you have to think about what are the causes clinically, right? So as for example, like if you have aortic stenosis and the aortic valve stenosis, what's going to happen? The wall stress is high and after, a, you know, after load is high. So it's slowly is going to recruit more muscle by Frank Sterling carbowise. And then you'll see, you know, thickening of the heart muscles, and, and to overcome that pressure gradient across the aortic valve, overcome the afterload. So, so that's, the, that's the thinking process you need to start developing in your mind, three-dimensional way. As for example, if it's a PDA or VSD, you think about, okay, this volume overload is going to be on the right side first, not on the left side, right side first. Then initial enlargement, you're going to see on the, on the right side. Right ventricle, and, uh, uh, right ventricle and right atrial enlargement. And subsequently in the later stage, you might see coming on the left side. That will be the late stage of the situation. The, the, this, this clinical thought process and understand that all valves, all the valves, they don't have any active mechanism. They're passive, right? It depends on the gradient. So that's why when you put the taper valve, you just put it there, leave it there and it starts working because of the gradient. There's no active process. So I, I like the students and trainees to think about three dimensional way, look at, and also look at the axis, and then you can figure out the correlation between the hypertrophy and clinical situation. You know, what are the clinical causes could be? Because if it is like pulmonary stenosis, what's the effect is going to be? Blood cannot flow to the right, to the lungs. The pressure on the right ventricle would be higher, right? And that can reflect the right ventricular thickness, and then also can reflect in the long term right atrial enlargement. So like tetralogy of fellow, right? Main, main, main problem is on the right side. 
So thickening of the right ventricle is going to happen. So if you, if you, if you think about three-dimensional way and keep in mind, then you don't have to memorize what are the causes of that. So, and you know, this is clinically very important. When you see the ECG, also put in your mind the what are the potential causes could be. So, thank you. Can I make a comment? Yes. Uh, this clinical connection is so much important in practical life. Let's say a, you are working in a upajala center. A patient has come, hypertensive. He's complaining that, that he has shortness of breath whenever he's getting weight. Look at his ECG. You find there is only lepidian enlargement. No evidence of lepidical hypertrophy. But that suggests the patient has elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressure. That's why the left has become bigger. And that suggests the patient is very likely to have LVH. You should remember ECG is least very, very much less sensitive. But the adjunct sign, uh, findings that can help you to reach a conclusion. That means this patient has LV diastole dysfunction, and he's going to have a heart failure preserve ejection fraction. That's the way we should interpret science and every findings of NECG, of chamber enlargement. Sir, I have a question, uh, Rufik Ahmed, sir. Rufik Ahmed, sir, can I ask you a question? Sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, many a times we see the patient uh, with LVH or HCM having the pattern of a short PR interval. Can we straightway say it's a due to accessory pathway or it is inherent to HCM? Uh, the question is, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with short wave is not always present. Um, it's just uh, where the P wave is coming from. And also two, two factor, one is the P wave coming from really high up in the sinatrial node or in the lower part of the sinatrial node. And that will change the PR interval. Number two, AV conduction can be accelerated. And rarely you can have a um, uh, pathway, nodo uh, fascicular pathway to make the PR short. So that's about it. I, I just reported as a finding without making too many comments. We have to be careful about over-interpreting something. Um, what would mention something that if you are in a Upojala health complex and you think somebody has LVH, um, and you can make an assumption, maybe there is gastric dysfunction. I mean, this is the good old clinical medicine that our professors used to practice. We didn't have anything at all, no investigation, nothing. But we at least have the EKG available. You have to be careful also that same patient can have a dilated cardiomyopathy. Yes. That was. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it is, it's, you can make some idea about it. But then if you do, if it is uh, somebody has heaving apical heartbeat, um, really, and then LVA, then you know it's probably not dilated. So th that's where the clinical medicine comes in. But be careful about over-interpreting um, uh, ECG and getting too much out of it. Thank you. Sir, assalamu alaikum. Can I make some comments, sir? Sure, sure. please do. So uh, ventricular enlargement and hypertrophy gives us the, um, the assessment of the ventricular which chamber involved. But as well in uh, congenital heart disease, we have some clues with axis and clockwise and co counterclockwise loop. Means if a case uh, in a ASD, we get RBB with a normal axis, right axis or left axis. So if we get a normal axis with RBB, then it gives us the clue of uh, it is a uh, second, second ASD second dump. If there is left axis with RBB, it is uh, ASD primum. And if uh, we get uh, RV hypertrophy along with RBB in ASD, that is also give a clue us that operable case of ASD present or not. If uh, there is monophasic uh, RVH means uh, uh, QR pattern with strain pattern. It gives us that ASD with having severe pulmonary hypertension, uh, hypertension and the axis going towards right axis. 
it also uh, gives us clue that this patient is becoming inoperable. Uh, like uh, in VSD also, axis is very important in diagnosis in hemodynamic significance and the type of VSD. Like in VSD, usually we get left-sided chamber enlargement along with normal axis. But if we get left axis, then it gives us a clue that it is inlet extension of VSD. Because we know that inlet VSD and ASD primum, there is endocardial cushion defect, and there may involvement of the AB uh, conduction tissue maldevelopment. So the axis in ASD primum, AB canal defect, and inlet VSD, the axis will be left axis. In also uh, here in VSD, that Wadul sir mentioned, in a uh, cardiologist or pediatrician, history is very important. If patient having no symptom, previously having respiratory tract infection, and now having no infection, no respiratory uh, result, then it gives us a clue that the pulmonary pressure becoming irreversible. And ECG also gives us a good clue that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, Shomir sir has uh, explained that cat vactal phenomenon that is present in uh, um, uh, tall V3, uh, V5, V4 has tall uh, R and deep S, more than 50. And along with this axis, we are getting right axis that it is suggestive of that this patient is giving on Eisenmenger syndrome. But cat vectal phenom phenomenon with biventricular forces with normal axis, this patient still having symptom is, gives a clue that it, can, it is an operable case and we will send the surgeon for early intervention. And uh, another thing is clockwise and counterclockwise loop. In clockwise loop, Usually in normal person and most of the congenital, uh, congenital heart disease has clockwise loop evident by Q wave in lead two, three AVF. And counterclockwise loop Q in lead one and AVL that gives us that it is a case of left axis involvement means uh, inlet BST or uh, ASD primum or some other complex congenital heart disease like single ventricle, DORV, this type of. So, Axis, RVH, LVH, clockwise, counterclockwise, and history, along with ECG findings, we can help the patient to uh, reach the diagnosis and give a um, uh, early intervention is needed or not, sir. Thank you. Uh, I, just, I just want to make a quick comment on this. So for the audience, look, what uh, Naruma actually described very fluently and we have a group of people here. We are, each of us are experts in our own field. So as a collective, we have a significant amount of knowledge. But what Naruma just said, I could not have said all those things, even though I know EKG very well. And that's the humility of this. So, so what I would like the audience to do, but remember the point. So if you see something funny, open the book. I still do it. And today you don't have background. Repeat, okay. please, uh, silent. Okay. So, so, so what? Can you make silent, please? mute for them, please. So, it is, it is so important that we we cannot store a huge amount of information in our brain, but we can store part of it. And then we can... Kamrul, please, background bond the current. Okay. So... Uh, so the, the point I was trying to make is that the point I was trying to make is that we have to be, we need okay. um, the point I was trying to make that we must keep the habit of opening the book. And today, actually, we don't have to open the book. You can Google it. Mr. Google is amazing amount of information that is online available. So you can, when you find a funny ECG, just take a few minutes. So the, what I tell people that spend a little time, 
just don't cursorily look at it ECG. Give it a one or two minute time. And if you keep doing it over and over again, you will get it. Uh, and you will then remember it. Then, then again, after a few months, you will forget it again. I, I forget it. And then I remind myself again. I keep doing it again and again. And I have been doing it for the last 40 years. So please do that. Thank you. I'd like to make one comment here uh, that uh, it's very important to get some idea from the ECG, but uh, the specificity and sensitivity is not that great uh, with the all the understanding that we have. So in order to like, particularly in congenital heart disease, uh, in order to define whether the patient is a surgical candidate or not, I believe those sort of situation, right heart catheterization is important. We really need to definitely know or what's the uh, you know, uh, pulmonary pressure, uh, whether it is uh, way up more than two thirds or not, that's, that's a criteria to do. And, and definitely some other criteria there, surgical criteria, well-developed criteria and guidelines there. So yes, ECG will give us some idea, but depending on that solely, I'll not send for surgery, probably I'll get a right heart catheterization first. And definitely they need to have surgical consultation, but in the process, we need to have better understanding of the right uh, you know, pulmonary pressure on those type of patient. Thank you. Afiz, thank you, Kevin. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Yeah. How do I think we can move on. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Uh, Shudhir, do you want to make some question or comment? Sir, yes, sir. Please. Sir. Please proceed. My first question is, uh, do we still use the term left atrial enlargement and the right atrial enlargement? So we know that even without enlargement of the atria, we can have the ECG abnormalities due to any diseases. If there is a scarring in the atria, there is deposition disease or something else. So I think the term has to be changed. In some textbooks, it, it is recommending that left atrial abnormality, abnormality and the right atrial yes. abnormality has to be used mm -hmm. instead of enlargement and dilatation. And it is also said that in extreme right atrial enlargement, the ECG may mimic left atrial enlargement. Yes. So what is the mechanism of that? And when we have extreme left atrial enlargement, the P wave amplitude may increase and it may again mimic that of right atrial abnormality. So what is the mechanism? And why in left atrial enlargement, we have the increase in the duration of the P wave, but this is not the case in case of the right atrial enlargement. Why we get the increased amplitude in case of the right atrial enlargement? So these are my few questions. All right, I can, uh, uh, I can answer. No, 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 let the speaker do this. Okay. Shamir, questions for you. Samir, can you unmute? Yeah. There is a left atrial, uh, he is uh, absolutely right, says that uh, the term with the left atrial enlargement may be uh, changed uh, to abnormalities. But in case of left atrial enlargement, it is due to left atrial uh, hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement, or scaring, or there is a conduction abnormalities. So in case of, uh, uh, it may be mimicked, uh, there is a uh, left atrial enlargement may look like uh, it may be associated with uh, increased uh, height of the uh, P wave uh, usually. So uh, that's also. Can I make some comment? Uh, look at the heart. The right atrium, left atrium, they're overlapping uh, in the uh, just right atrium uh, is in front of the left atrium. The SA node in the right atrium, if it is enlarged hypertrophy, the time to travel the whole of the right atrium, it takes a little bit money, it doesn't take much time. So within the normal time period that takes to uh, depolar uh, depolarize the left atrium, right atrium is already depolarized, only the amplitude will be increased because of the increased muscle mass. But what about left atrium? If it is enlarged, the time for the impulse to conduct from the SA node, which is at the right end of the right atrium, to the end of the left atrium, it will be longer. And that's why it's increased in the duration. That's the point. And I also remember, whenever there is huge right atrial enlargement, 
look the uh, when we uh, record the ECG, the V1 or V2 leaves, they are placed in a fixed position. But in the, the heart is enlarged, the, the atrium enlarges downwards. The whole force of the current is actually, main force of the current is going down. That's why sometimes right atrial nerve presents with current going down, negative amplitude uh, in, in the V1. And that mimics left atrial enlargement. So one Music comment time. about the terminology. So let's say there is a septal MI by ECG. The reason it happened is somebody put the leads high up uh, in lead intercostal space. So by ECG, we report as a septal MI. That doesn't mean that the patient has septal MI. That's where the sensitivity and specificity of the test come in. Same with left head enlargement. When we find that there is left head, of course, there is, there is a degree of sensitivity and specificity that we need to look at. Now, on the other hand, if we keep talking about um, left atrial and abnormality, then ECG, we're going to report ECG at the end, abnormal ECG without describing any finding at all. So that's where the problem comes in. Um, and I agree totally that some of the cases where ECG will report as left atrial abnormal enlargement, actually, there is no enlargement. And the only way you can find it is by echo. And I think this will be true for left ventricular hypertrophy also, that there will be a number of patients who will have ECG finding of left ventricular hypertrophy. If you do echo and do muscle mass, there will be not. And that's, again, it comes to the point of sensitivity of, and specificity of a test. Uh, thank you. So other way. I just wanted to make one comment um, because uh, I think ECG is a tool uh, and a key to clinical diagnosis. So don't get too much emotional about uh, diagnosing everything through one EKG. And on the other hand, the key is to recognize the EKG abnormality and use that as a key to other investigations and other evaluation. I think sometimes we get bogged down with, with mm -hmm. that as well. So, um, for example, in a young patient in a, in a remote area with some LVH and the patient is lean, thin, you don't give a diagnosis and then the family will be devastated with that diagnosis that heart is enlarged. So I think we have a responsibility too. And I think in a, in a resource uh, constrained area, it is even more important to know this better so that we don't cause unnecessary anxiety um, for, for this kind of thing, you know? Um, so let me see whether um, I can upload this. What is the, I'm trying to figure out, do you see my? Um, Not yet. Today is 21st, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so um, I actually asked one of my fellow, interestingly, uh, He's from originally from India. His dad actually is a cardiologist in uh, in Dubai. I, I did not know until uh, he was accepted in the program. Um, so this is the EKG of a patient, and uh, so let's see. Rafik Bai always mentions and also mentioned today over calling and under calling. So just we need to be just right, but it is okay. Answering EKG in the exam, I tell the fellows, is one thing. The best thing about EKG at bedside, you have the patient and correlate with the patient. Please correlate with the patient. So this is a patient came in um, and then EKG. Anyone wants to give a differential? So looks like sinus, right bundle, lead AVR ST elevation, and then deep ST depression in the precordial leads, right? 
and then look at the inferior, the lead three clearly ST elevation, right? So, what do they comment? You're you're uh, you're muted. The basic rule: if you have QAB only in one lead, it do, it doesn't count. You have right. to have QAB in two contiguous lead at least. Yeah, and but importantly, the the I mean that is the inferior story. But look at the uh, precordial, and I need to convince the year attending that this is not a STEMI, or it is a STEMI. I want to take to the cat lab. Uh, whenever we check about ST segment elevation, the point is you have to count it from the ST junction, 80 millisecond uh, discharge. And if we consider that, then the ST, uh, the, the changes are not that marked. Is part of the right bundle branch block connection delay. For the V1, probably we can say, but the AVR is worrisome and yes. ST depression is there. So it is abnormal, but the clinical context is very important. And this is the clinical context. Cardiac arrest, PA arrest, and patient is known to have ischemic cardiomyopathy, cabbage, end stage renal disease, and then came to us following the cardiac arrest. Uh, what is the level of potassium? Okay, so potassium, and then look at the acidosis. Acidosis, yes. And then look at the chest texture. So, uh. and the temperature was 102. So it is important to give a differential because you know in the COVID time we we realized that hypoxia, acidosis, AVR, ST elevation, and it, it may look like is uh, left main multivessel, but it may not be. Just metabolic abnormality can give you that. And then we did not take to the cath lab. All corrected, and as Wadud pointed out, now it is clear that the ST abnormality in the V1 was part of the RVB, but the ST depression is much better. And the uh, thing is that, uh, Hafiz Bhai, when you have a bundle branch block pattern, right bundle branch block in computer yeah. complete, then the AVR ST elevation doesn't count. AVS, I agree, but if there is a profound ST depression, in the other side, then it is difficult to ignore. So, um, so anyway, this patient uh, ultimately uh, um, could not make it because yeah. we actually found EKG before he coded, potassium went up and, and the patient died. Um, another of Slovik Bay is here. This patient is in the floor and had an EKG and then they are asking that, what do you think about the white complex tacky in the middle of the EKG? For two questions, one is baseline rhythm, and then in the middle, what is happening? If you look at the rhythm strip, then lead two, it completely changes axis when it goes into a tacky. So we read it as atrial fibrillation baseline and non-sustained VT. And they are asking that the that what we do next. What was the clinical scenario? Okay, so this is the part I like. I love Wadu. Always ask the clinical scenario. Don't, don't jump. And this is the part we are, as a clinician, look at this. Patient has uh, metastasis, intracranial mass. <laughs> and then this happened, you know? And we need to be realistic. And sometimes the primary doctors, they 
forget to ask these questions and they expect too much from us. So we said, do LIA, LIA, leave it alone. Okay, um, can you go back to the first TCG, please? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the first of all, the uh, for the audience, uh, we need to determine what is the baseline. It's very difficult to determine from the beginning of the recording, but if you look at the end of the recording in lead two, it's very irregular and there is no P wave. So it's actual fibrillation. So the question is that this, after the fourth bit, the QRS morphology changes and there is a degree of irregularity. And one can always argue that this is actual fibrillation with rate related bundle bunch block. But then you look at lead two. If you look at lead two, if it aberrated right bundle or left bundle, the pattern should not be like this. It changes completely, number one. The other thing that quickly look at lead V2. If you look from the beginning of the QRS to the deepest point of S wave, it is more than 100 milliseconds. And that goes with the VT. So these are the th quick, I mean, I, I, I thought that we should get something out of this, that this is a common yeah. question that yeah. we get asked, is it apparent conduction? And the other thing that you have to look at, to get aberrant conduction, you normally you require a long short sequence, but we don't have that long short sequence here. So why would this, uh, the first bit suddenly become aberrant? So all those criteria is non-sustainability. Of course, I mean, and, the treatment. And the, this and is the X, is, X is changed and then RR interval is very regular in the, yeah. in the, in the middle of this. Yeah, when the, the RR problem, interval is irregular. Yeah. Somebody with metastatic cancer, they should not be unmonitored. We always face this problem. And then they get non-sustained VT. What do you do with this? This patient, it will be a blessing, unfortunately, if the patient develops VF and something yeah. happens to him. Um, yeah. But we always get questions about it. But then again, that as a physician, it is my job when they call me to calm the family and the referring physician down because when they are asking my opinion, I have to give them an opinion. They are not as always asking for solution. Remember that when physicians consult us, they are also asking for support to support their own decision. And my job as an electrophysiology consultant, I'll go and talk to the patient, I'll talk to the family, I'll talk to the referring doctor and convince them, look, this patient has metastatic cancer, and I don't think it is a good idea to do anything. But when you do that, you have to spend time with the family and get a good relationship with them. And that helps out the primary physician. And it is, that's what we do. We are not always into the business of curing or fixing things. Afi, do you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And this is the, my contribution to the case was to call the palliative care and, uh, and then ask for DNR. And it is very important because I see this, and I'm sorry to say this, I, uh, I see this here and also in Bangladesh that we don't address this DNR issue. This patient goes into court, CPR, then gets intubated. It's a mess and it's a bigger cost to the family without any uh, good outcome. Um, and also I wanted to request to you that, um, uh, that, that please uh, check the RR interval and then do as much as you can and best try to understand the mechanism of ventricular depolarization and mechanism of atrial depolarization. If you don't see any atria, at least try to figure out what is happening with the QRS complexes and the RR interval and change of axis. These are simple things. And don't let anyone intimidate you because of the EKG. Because you can do as much as you can, do as best as you can, know things better, and when you know better, then you do better. So um, this is sir, another patient. Sir, I have a question. Uh, yeah. In the previous ECG, so to yeah. Rafik sir. Sir, it has been a teaching that when you see a very wide complex tachycardia, so which is called really wide regular tachycardia, you must exclude metabolic causes. So if we look at the ECG, 
though it is obvious that it could be VT, but if we see at the duration of the QRS, it's almost 200 milliseconds. And it said that if it is more than 180 milliseconds, that the ventricular tachycardia is, don't go more on the side of the ventricular tachycardia. So what do you think? Yeah. Do we need to go more on the side of metabolic okay. cause or? No, 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 no. Absolutely. Let, let me answer. Let me, answer. Let, me answer. Let, me answer. let me, yeah. because I work with the resident and the fellows and I understand the, the disease problem. So first identify what is this QRS widen and this tacky episode? What is the underlying cause? That is a different story. But find out what happening here. And is it a ventricular tachycardia or is it a, what is the differential of uh, white complex tachycardia? Just go through that rule because why regular white complex tachycardia, which I'm sure Rovigba is going to give you a differential right now, but but then if you think that this is a differential, find out the underlying etiology. But you cannot just jump by looking at the EKG, this is metabolic. But go by the rule book, the methodology that, what is this rhythm first? What is happening here? Perfect way. Yeah. So Shamir, you, you actually brought up a very nice point, but look at lead V2. There are sharp points in this ECG. Usually metabolic and electrolyte abnormality, you will, you will get what we call sine waves. So look at lead V2, there is a sharp point beginning and the end. Lead V1, there are sharp points. And these things point more towards less metabolic. Than, but of course, I will remember that. Now, if it is metabolic, another problem is why will it happen suddenly, not happen with the other ECGs? So here I have both narrow and wide QRS. So that takes away. But of course, if I had, can you go to the Hafiz next ECG, please? The same patient, next, there was another ECG. Yes. This one. Now, okay, look at this. If I had just lead V3 all over the place, then I will be in trouble. I will say, wow, this looks like almost like a sine wave. But even then, there are sharp points. There is a sharp tip. There is a sharp deflection on the downstroke. So yes, so the, if I just had lead V3 on a long rhythm strip, no question about it. But then again, in this one, I have both narrow and white QRS. So that takes away the metabolic part. Thank you. But that was a very good point. Thank you. And, and the issue is that even if you call it metabolic or whatnot, it is tachycardia, right? Look at the V3 in this EKG. It is wide complex tachycardia. So let's not, the question is, what is the probability of underlying issue? Is it hyperkalemia? If you have a suspicion, treat it, don't wait. And then is it a ischemic substrate? Address that. Is it a heart failure? Address that. So is it a scar related BT? Address that. That's the thing I'm trying to make that and stabilize the patient. And in this case, of course, the issue came out as the, uh, as the futility of care. So this is another patient with uh, right foot pain and then uh, other uh, issues with infection came in with this EKG and there is this pacer spikes in the middle of tachycardia. Question is, why there is pacer spikes in the middle of tachycardia? I tell the residents, particularly the residents, find out is the EKG sinus rhythm or not sinus rhythm, if you see the P wave, tachycardia or bradycardia, white complex or narrow complex. Go with the simple and does it have a pattern? Is a bundle pattern or not bundle pattern? So I think sometimes we need to make it easy and, and then explain. If you jump on trying to explain, then you lose the obvious things and, and feels, it feels like for the residents, like intimidated. So I told them, look at this EKG, tachycardia, yes. Is it regular or irregular? 
rules like there is little irregularity. So it looks like there is bundle pattern, most likely left bundle pattern, a few. But then this is for the fellows. Why in the middle of the left a few fast ventricular rate, there is a pacer spike. I actually added this one because I, I thought Ravik Bhai will not be here. But since Ravik Bhai is here, I added this one quickly. <laughs> <laughs> So you want me to talk about it or no? I don't know. If, I, of course, I want to talk. You want you to talk. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Rubik Bhai. So please remember one thing. The modern ECGs are actually um, electronic machines. They don't write direct things. First thing I have to make sure that this patient has a pacemaker because modern, a lot of modern machines have tendency to put spikes when they, it doesn't present. It is not there. So first I look in the chart, does the patient have a pacemaker? It doesn't matter how much expert in pacing I am, doesn't matter much. Second would be if there is a pacemaker, what is happening if somebody has any supraventricular arrhythmia, <clears throat> it will track it before it mode switches. So it is possible that there is some kind of actual arrhythmia that was tracked and paced at a higher rate and then it mode switch and it no longer present because then it goes to a fixed rate pacer. And the problem that you're facing that you see these spikes only in V2, we don't see it in other leads. And it happens with pacemakers because nowadays with bipolar pacemaker with different kind of filtration, you don't see spikes. So please, um, that's it, thank you. Yeah, and is it possible that under sensing of the uh, atrial lead can give you? So the question is, can under sensing of atrial lead do the spikes? Number one, the rate is 480 millisecond. We don't program pacer rate, atrial rate that high. It can only happen if it is tracking something. So that is very, very unlikely. If we it were under set. And, and Ruby, I also do the math. I told the fellows to do the math that the pacer spike lead V2, I pointed out, that RR interval is actually the upper limit of the pacer. So yes. that makes sense. Yeah. And what is the chance that you will see two atrial spike just before the QRS complex? The probability is very little. Yeah. So it's, not, it's a ventricular pacing. So we are running out of time. Let me finish this 57 year old uh, follow up in the clinic for left uh, lower extremity wounds and the uh, temperature high. And this is the EKG. Uh, this is a quick one. So, um, you know, Dr. Kundu presented this uh, EKG with the right ventricular hypertrophy P pulmonary fits in very well with the uh, mitral stenosis. Remarkably, that patient was in sinus rhythm with the mitral stenosis. But this patient has tall R wave and then the axis is left axis. Uh, but the question is, uh, we read it as, you know, atrial fibrillation and bifascicular block. Um, will you call it right ventricular hypertrophy as well? With a right axis change, it's very difficult to tell something like that. Yeah, so uh, uh, what do then? <laughs> I love this. So the, it is more than seven millimeter in the V1. So you get tempted to call it right ventricular hypertrophy. However, the right axis is not deviated. So we don't know, but keep this in mind. Then you can do further evaluation. So EKG may not solve all problem, but just keep in, in your mind that there is an abnormality. And unlike the previous EKG, look at the AV segment on lead AVR. There is no ST elevation and ST elevation looks like the part of the QRS, not a separate 
ST segment elevation. And then the ST depression here, and I compared this with the previous, is not as profound as before. So it is clinical context that is very important how you treat these patients. So this is another one with uh, endosteginal disease, fistula, PCI, bad cardiomyopathy, history of PE arrest in the past. Coming with this EKG, how you tackle this patient? Very regular, it seems. Yeah. <clears throat> so, <laughs> the STEMI was actually one of the thing, So, one of the things the ER dogs do, Rovik Bhai knows in the US, if they cannot figure out, they call it a STEMI. And then you figure it out. <laughs> This was his baseline EKG in the past. No, 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 don't show the baseline. <laughs> step back, step back, please. Because that's the ECG that you're going to be faced with. Yeah. I wish I could, we could bring somebody from the audience, but there are very few people left. Um, just look at one lead, lead V1. After where it's written V1, there is a QRS complex, there is no P before that. But the next one, there is a P. And, but the PR is very short. And then there is nothing. And there is something after the QRS complex, which most likely is a P. So I think this ECG has evidence. Interesting part, if you look at lead one, it looks like typical left bundle branch block pattern. Um, yeah. But that is the clue to this ECG yeah. that I will call it a slow VT. So low VT, yeah. So and then uh, go back, go to the next ECG, the one that baseline. Yeah. But this is a very good ECG, Hafiz, because yeah. if I could draw a P wave before the QRS, it will be typical left bundle, right? It will be very difficult to debate that out. Yeah. Yeah. Every decision is actually clue. Yeah. And okay, oh, so okay, look, look at this. Can you go back, please? Let's go back to that, that ECG. Can you go back again? Go back to the ECG. Yeah, this is the one. Can you see it? Uh, the one before that. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah, look at lead V5, V6. Yeah. And actually, yeah. I, and, and I go to forward, please. Next one. Next so this is post post yeah, uh, next, next is post uh, CRTD. Yeah, oh, it's a different thing. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thanks. No, oh, fine. Thank you. So this patient bad cardiomyopathy, biatrial enlargement, history of AFI. We actually did a CRTD after the uh, AV nodal ablation. Uh, I will finish with these two EKGs because these are very important ones. Um, I think for this. Uh, and we have a series of this. Uh, if the ER calls it as a STEMI, will you agree? Again, the typical ST elevation is in only P1. And if you are? That's why this the ST depression mostly. A VR is a still vision. As well. Yeah. So and then the clinical the context will be much important here. Very, very important. And this is the thing in the US, some hospitals, they just call a STEMI and they, the cat lab stuff arrives before you come and then they take it to the cat lab. But I usually say, I explain to me that why I need to go to the cat lab, you know? So this man presented with uh, cardiac arrest, downtime 10 minutes. And then all these were given, epi, bicarb and all that. And uh, look at that potassium. 
acidosis. And we need to follow that. It's totally metabolically deranged. And uh, the pH was bad. And usually pH less than 7.1, bad prognosis, bad prognosis, less than 6.9 should not go to the cat lab. And I can accept, and the fellows laugh at me, I have taken cases for 6.9, but I broke the rule because the clinical situation, no other explanation, downtime very short, and witnessed cardiac arrest. I kind of took the uh, patient, but generally do not take. This is another important thing. Yes. I think we should, we should stop here. It's 11 o'clock, okay. right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Athar Bhai, will you sum up? So excellent session today and uh, Dr. Swamir Kundu. Sir, Swamir Kundu is a really teacher, sir. He's an icon teacher now, very popular among our students. He's a really teacher than the clinician and the cardiologist. He is all the three, that is cardiologist, clinician and teacher, but he is a very, very favorite teacher. I also like him and our students very much like him. He's a real teacher, sir. So, Dr. Swamir Kundu, thank you very much for your excellent, nice and beautiful a presentation and you initiated an excellent discussion today. And uh, Hafiz Bhai, again, it was a nice session finally from your ECG. Sir, June 12, our next session, and Robik sir is the speaker, sir. But I mean, I don't think I can do it because I'll be in Bangladesh at that time. Oh. <laughs> okay. Sir, I'm going to be connected. <laughs> I mean, actually, May 30, take a junior at Hotelic. The Shamashology BCPS program, I say, plus BCPS CPR course take camera to me yet a Mondo Queda. Cambrul yet a Mondo Kodo. Cambrul is streaming Mondo Kodo. Thanks, everybody. Ribu? Sarpandu Gursu, sir. Thank you, Bhai. So, with the BCPSA, I'm going to start the CPR program. So, I'm going to start the CPR program.